Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining me. We're just doing our regular monthly update a little late this month. I apologize for that, but uh, it's been hectic times. Do you want me to do a, a speech like normal first and then some questions? Or you want to jump in with some questions right away? I'm indifferent. Speech. Talk speech. a little bit. So our August uh, priorities, you may recall, uh, sanitation, uh, get this place cleaner, make people feel uh, well, just be more prideful in our workspace. Uh, Brad has joined us. Where's Brad? Here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Happy to have you aboard. I want this place spick and span. You need resources, you let me know. I'm the president, by the way. I'm Scott. <laughs> okay. I drop in every now and then. <laughs> Anyways, the place is looking a lot better. Everybody agree with that? Uh -huh. uh, but we got a long way to go. And. Uh, uh, that's 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 a high priority for me. Another thing we talked about was maintenance. So what we accomplished uh, a little bit late in August, and actually it went into early September, was just a laundry list from everybody relevant as to um, what our maintenance issues are. Um, and this, of course, includes both regular, preventative, uh, major projects. So we've just got this into a massive list, and now our next step is to sit down. We're going to start prioritizing those and create a system to uh, work through that. So I wouldn't call that a huge success from August, but at least we got started on that. Um, uh, we talked in, uh, in our last meeting that one of my priorities was to start looking at producing to have a week or two of finished goods on our uh, highly turning SKUs. And for those of you that are new, you know, it, it's really, it's really uh, I forget the number, 4%, I think of everything we make generates about 80% of our revenue. And so why would we not just have uh, a week or two weeks or some amount of finished goods? So when we receive orders for those products, we just take them off the shelf. That would result in less, less changeovers, um, uh, better fill rates, uh, better materials handling management, all those sorts of good things. Uh, we've accomplished nothing on that so far, and I'm gonna talk about that uh, in a little bit as to why that's been going slower than it ought to have been going. It's related to the backlog issue as well. Uh, financial reporting, uh, none of you guys, uh, well, those of you at the front office care, but none of you guys in the back really care about this. But to me, I need to know the numbers. As I told you before, again, if you're new here, when we bought this company, they had, you know, the accounting, everybody did their best to keep the debits and credits moving, but things hadn't been reconciled and things were clean for months and months and months. But I am now starting to get monthly reports more or less on time. So for example, I'm gonna get August uh, tomorrow, which is the 22nd of September, um, which is um, not a good date, apart from being my mother's birthday, <laughs> is uh, is not a good date. The, um, no, she's in October. All right, sorry about that one. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like somebody has a birthday in September. I just need to remember who. Um, <clears throat> the, um, uh, you know, I, I'd like to get those around the 10 or 15, so I don't actually have numbers to report to you today uh, as to where we are. Um, uh, but, but I think that's, I'm just checking that system off as being done. We're able to report now and we're able to start managing the business. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the hourly labor raise uh, that went through two weeks ago, something like that. Well, that for me, I'm gonna tell you what my thinking was, but I wouldn't have been able to do that if I didn't have financial reporting coming in so that I could understand what our margins was and what this meant on a, to the company on a cost uh, per sink basis. And, uh, what I like to think about a contribution margin, which is gonna bore all you guys, but if you're interested, you can go watch it on the on the show that you know about. We'll talk more about that later as well. But the importance of it is for me to make management decisions, I need to have some numbers. And uh, so we're starting to get those in. Um, performance in August was eh, it was okay. Um, I don't have the hard numbers yet. I'm, I'm certain we broke even or did a little bit better. So it wasn't, it didn't rock like July, but September is already gonna, kick ass compared to July and August. This happens, right? You get, it's just timing of when you get stuff out the door and as our supply chain is fixing itself, I told you guys, you know, we fixed the financial side of the supply chain, but then it takes maybe three months or even longer in this case for it just to flow through. By the way, on that front, uh, I understand we have a, 
container finally showing up from the slow boat from China, which uh, hopefully is coming in this week, which will be a bunch of those uh, little strainer parts that we're missing that can clean out a lot of stuff, which would be good. All right, so that's uh, that's from August. Again, we, you know, it's nice that we we hit a, a, a black month, so to speak, as opposed to a red month. And um, I don't have the hard numbers yet, but I'm certain that's where it's going to end up. And we're already three weeks into September, and things look things look pretty good. You guys had a great week last week getting shipments out, by the way. All right, so listening to her. Um, I haven't done many, I don't know, five, six, something like that. I've talked about them a lot. Uh, and Angela, I wanna restart those, summer's over. Um, so if we can maybe next week, start booking about three a week mm -hmm. by Zoom and work with Ashley to get those scheduled for me. And for those of you that don't know, this is about an hour. Uh, so Bradley, it's about an hour. I'm, I'm sitting down with every employee as best I can. And it, there's no, there's no uh, order to this as to who we talk to. So if you're if you're anxious to get to talk to me, talk to Angela and she'll get you scheduled early. If you if you if you're not anxious, maybe somebody else is, but you'll just reach out and get these things booked. And so I'm sitting down with people for an hour and I'm just asking you, you know, what, what your job is, what your job description is, and what do you see that has been wrong with Navani that could be fixed? And what do you see positive about Navani? And the the idea here from my perspective is you just learn you learn so much because you guys know the answers, okay? And and I'll give you some examples of some things that you learn, not necessarily specific to Navani, but I, I have found, because I do this in every, for those that don't know me, I'm an expert at jumping into troubled companies and trying to change culture and turn things around and, and make things profitable. We get a pretty good track record of doing that. And if you listen to the employees, as opposed to senior management, right, where you get a filtered, confirmation bias impression of what's going on you think about it, if you're a if you're a leader i'm not picking on frank because he's not here but um if, if you're a leader of any organization and you've had all of these inputs and you've tried this and you've tried that and you're losing right your company is losing money things aren't going in the right direction and then someone comes along and says what's wrong <laughs> with this company well you give your already filtered impression of what's wrong with the company. Whereas if you, so you're, you're automatically biased. So what are the odds of that leader saying, that's ah, me, it's me. Like I'm just not doing things right. That's not gonna, you're just never gonna hear that, right? But if you go to the employees and you the people who are actually doing the work, you get some pretty low hanging fruit. And I'm not saying that everybody has the right answers, but I've just listened to five or six people and you get some pretty, you get some pretty strong consensus um, that makes it pretty obvious that there's some things that need to change. In 100% of troubled companies, I've found that the actual work being done the employees does not match the job description that that employee was hired for. Anybody feel familiar on that one? Right, I think you all do, I've heard that a lot. And, and why is that a problem? Well, as a, as a leader, that means that your org chart, your organization chart, because you you know you get these little lines and boxes and you slot people around like you're a war general. Well, that's all just bullshit because people aren't doing the work that you hired them to do. You put them in this box, but they're off doing this, okay? And so your incentives are wrong because people aren't doing what you're incentivizing them to do and you have pay equity problems. What does pay equity means? It means you hired a, a gal or, or a guy to do this job at X rate, and yet their person, they're doing this job, which really ought to be at this rate, okay? And if you're on the podcast, I'm holding my hands up at different levels. But the point being, I just make up a number. You hire somebody to do a $20 an hour job, and yet they're filling in, they're doing the best that they can because the company needs it, and they're doing they're doing an 18 hour, $18 an hour job, all right? Again, just making up numbers. Now you wanna hire somebody for that job at $18, yet the guy doing it right now is getting 20 is getting 20, right? So you have these pay equity, inequity issues, and that's no good for an organization. And what you're gonna, I'm gonna give you a couple of these examples, and what happens is all of that is bad for morale, and it's bad for teamwork. And so uh, uh, I'm starting to see that through these listening tours, but take it away from the money, 100% of troubled companies uh, in manufacturing, that's what happens. Big deal for me is, as an employee, when you wake up in the morning 
that you're passionate and excited and you know the one, two, or a maximum three things that you're doing today that the company is relying on you to perform, that your teammates need you to execute on um, for this company to work. And what happens to troubled companies when you ask the employees that, that, uh, that question, what are your three things? What do you wake up and worry about this morning? They don't know the answer. They don't know the answer. Management hasn't communicated it strongly enough. They're dragged around and all of a sudden the three things is 20 things and nobody can do 20 things all day and be passionate about it. They try, right? You, you work as hard as you can and you juggle all the stuff that you can do, but you're not focusing on the core of what needs to be done for the organization because the environment hasn't been created where you're able to do that. Sound familiar to anybody? Right, seen a lot of nodding heads, okay? 100% of troubled companies, we're not unique. We're gonna fix that. 100% of troubled companies, the employee's view of their job, if I ask you what your job is and I had your leader beside you and I asked that person first what their view of the job is, it would be entirely different, right? So the, so the leader says, well, yeah, and I, I could take this out of Navani's context. I, I, I went through it in a food company in Toronto about a year and a half ago and I sat down with the CEO who was a super smart um, HR consulting kind of guy who bought this company. And you know, an HR background, you think he would know this. Okay, well, what is this person's key job? And what are their top three things that they worry about? Never once is the answer from the employee the same is what the leader thinks, okay? Now, as a leader, if you can imagine yourself as a leader of an organization, um, here's what you need to know, is that the employees are gonna do something whether you direct them to or not. And if, and if you're not directing them, they're gonna do what they think is best, which may not be what you think is best or what needs to be done for the organization. I'll comment on you guys, you're all pitching in and doing what you can to get this done. But leadership is about being more directive than that. Okay, so there's a problem that we find. 100% um, of company, troubled companies I find is that the employees are way smarter and way more caring caring about their organization and their team, my, teammates than senior management uh, is led to believe, okay? Or lets themselves believe. Because what happens when you're in trouble as a leader is you start blaming other people. Guess who gets blamed, right? Everybody in this room, um, that's normal. Uh, we've put a stop to that. Leadership needs to take, well, I don't know if we put a stop to it, but we will be, we are starting to put a stop to that. We need to take ownership and we need to work together. I'm not, I also, by the way, I'm not f pointing fingers at senior management, okay? But the buck stops at the top. The buck stops with me now. And I'm asking you and we all need to work together to affect change, which I think we've been doing. I, I don't know if anybody would disagree with that at this point. Things have been going pretty well. And I already mentioned my last point on this that you'll learn from listening to her is that, is that senior management's view of what wrong is never the same as what the employees tell you is what's wrong because they have their own bias and there's not much you can do about that except ignore it. Go straight to you guys, ask you the questions, and man, are you giving me the answers. So I've gone over some of this before, the answers that I've got just from the short five or six uh, that we've done. One of them uh, has been this whole idea of labor shortage, um, extreme turnover, driven by the four days a week, uh, that they were doing through the pandemic, which you know you can't blame them, can't blame the company for that. But still, when I mean, you guys are making, you know, if you're somebody making 15, 16, 17 dollars an hour, and all of a sudden you're making four fifths of what you you used to, I don't know how you can be expected to live on that. So I also don't blame the people that left because they couldn't, you know, they had a better deal somewhere else. Uh, so we lost experience. Uh, we had shortages, which caused people to run around and and do two things at once or three things at once. Um, and we have trouble recruiting. And we have trouble recruiting because of, I think because of the four days, which is fixed, we're now on five days because we're at the low end of the pay scale. Um, and we're just, we're just having our lunch eaten. That's the bottom line. There's other people that are providing, have been, uh, not now, but have been providing uh, a better work environment for their employees, okay? And, and because of that, you get an overuse of temps. Um, if we have an 18, uh, Angela, if, we have a, if we're paying somebody $18 an hour, but we get them through a temp, what's the real cost to us? 50% uh, more than that. So 
another nine, twenty-seven dollars. Twenty-seven dollars an hour to pay somebody eighteen dollars an hour. And how well I, I got you guys that are temping here. I'm not picking on you because your our temps are mostly permanent temps, and in, in the sense yeah, that our goal you know is it's higher. a recruiting function, and they, we hope we hope and pray that you guys roll into a full time job here. Um, but if you're living on temps, you don't have trained people. You don't know the systems. You don't know the station that you're at. Right, and it takes a lot of time. But just think about it from the company's point of view. To pay 18, you got to pay out. What'd you say? 27? 27. I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy. And so those are all the problems. Um, that's a short list, but there's many more. But there's a short list of significant problems when you have shortage of personnel and you can't recruit. So I got some financial information in. I've heard you. Um, I want to be able to recruit. We need to be able to fix these problems. And so um, we issued a. Uh, to all hourly, correct me if I get this wrong, to all hourly personnel we issued a raise uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, it, it's uh, $2 an hour, didn't matter who you were, and correct me if I'm wrong, the temps, when they roll into permanent, will get that $2 an hour. So whoever's temp in here, if you can accelerate that process, I suggest you do it, right? And if you were an eighteen dollar an hour temp, you would be going to twenty, which is still seven dollars less than I'm paying the so temp. To accelerate that, when you work overtime, you hit your hours sooner and you get hired sooner. So overtime to can accelerate. Yell that out for okay. people. To, to accelerate that, if you work overtime, you hit your hours sooner and we can hire you sooner. Okay. Overtime. So there's a plan. So if you're a temp and you want a strategy, go talk to Angela, and she'll help you figure that out. All right. So we did that. Um, now, there was a big debate internally at the management level. What is this raise for? Uh, should it come from the supervisors so that the supervisors, you know, you know, uh, gain some credibility with their employees and vice versa, that it reinforces that message? Is it part of the year end? Is it part of the year end performance review? Is it part of the we have a skills matrix thing? Is it part of that? And, and the answer to all of that is no. Okay. This $2 is really simple. Novani Stainless is not the bottom of the barrel employer. All right, we're moving up the grid. Are we done at two dollars? I have no idea. Okay, maybe we are. Maybe we're not. Um, will there be a year-end process for merit and all and the skills matrix? Yes, we will be doing that as well. Doesn't mean you're getting another raise. Okay, <laughs> but this is about you talking to me, me listening. And this is part of my acting on changing the culture and the experience here at Navani. And because I don't want this company to be the bottom of the barrel, bottom line, okay? That's what this is for. So I've walked around today and a bunch of you are very grateful and, and I thank you. I love you, I love you that, that you come up and talk to me and say that you're grateful. But this is not really about merit at this point. This is about us acknowledging that we need to do better as a company and and i hope it helps you i hope it helps you a lot it's also about communicating to you that things are going better now you can see that in your organization but things are going a lot better than they were just two three months ago at navani uh, i like to call it uh, momentum winning momentum and what i ask from you is uh, be an ambassador when you're out of tim hortons when you're at the hockey game you're talking to your peers tell them hey things are going pretty good Things are going pretty good at Navani. And maybe you don't want to drive to Aurelia every day or wherever the hell people drive get to Barry or, you know, maybe there's a more local solution and that would help your company a lot. If you feel it, if you feel it, I'm not asking you to talk about something you're not comfortable with, but if you feel it, be an ambassador for your company and we're going to continue to make these changes. By the way, I think sanitation is a huge part of this. Like I just first came here, I wouldn't want to work here, right? And it already feels better okay and so it's not just about raises um, it's about some of the soft things as well anyways there's my message as to what that raise was about and uh, when we're done we'll take questions here and uh, we can talk more about it if you want September October I want to say my September goals but we're already here on the 21st um, backlog is a big one so I talked about getting this week or two of, of uh, finished goods inventory in place and that that seemed to be a bit of a, uh, well, no, a complete failure in August. It's related to the backlog issue. And having a backlog um, 
of a lot, which is what we have. If I could put it without disclosing too many numbers, our backlog a couple of weeks ago was one sixth to one seventh of our entire annual revenue. So that would be say 60 days of, of, uh, of backlog. All right, now some of that's gonna be blown out by the strainer container coming in, which will be helpful. But the bottom line is we don't deliver to our customers on a reasonable time frame, which is a function of labor, not having enough of it, uh, supply chain, productivity. <laughs> Want me to talk to them? No, okay. <laughs> supply chain, productivity, um, uh, maintenance, right? So we don't have breakdowns, that sort of stuff. Anyways, to get the finished goods, to me, I just treat this week or two of finished goods as being part of the backlog. We just need to do that. And here's the bottom line. Um, we produce on a per unit basis about the same or slightly more than the number of orders we get every week. So every week we crank through pretty much the same amount of orders that we got in. So we're not making any progress. We're just not making it. And the more orders we get in, the worse this problem gets, right? So you, now you guys are working 48 hours, mm -hmm. right, uh, uh, on mandatory. Now we're making slightly more units uh, each week than our backlog is. So I don't, I'm not standing here with the answer. I'm just saying this is a major issue uh, because every company in manufacturing that I've even in, not in manufacturing, I own a roofing company, a, a tools company, as you guys know, and I've talked about it before. And uh, a year ago when I took over as president, their fill rates were like zero or 10%. We just never shipped anything. And within about four months, we were just, if you, if you order a product there today, we're ready to ship it this afternoon. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is on the scheme. Now it's a way simpler organization. So I'm not saying that we're gonna get there or, or even in uh, a reasonable time frame. But what happens is when you start doing that, all your old customers start coming back because the word gets out into the marketplace. You don't have to do any marketing, right? It just starts f filtering out to the marketplace. You start getting new listings. Um, your current customers start ordering more. We started blowing out some of our competitors and we're up, even during a pandemic, I think we're now up 40% uh, revenue in that company simply for that reason. I've done it in other companies before and that's the experience you get. You get somewhere between 10, 15% growth in revenue to 30% growth in revenue just because you're shipping and because your customers start to come back to you and you get a sense of confidence. You can also start talking to your customers about pricing, right? When's the last time you increased prices? I don't know about Navani, but in general, you, you, companies never want to talk to their customer base. You never want to go to Home Depot and say, well, we're going to increase our prices a little bit, make more money, pay a little bit more on direct labor or in our overheads as a result, because you never ship, right? So you have all this backlog, you walk into the purchaser, you say, I, we know we need to increase prices. And they say, well, you don't ship to us anyway. So it doesn't, it's not a useful conversation, right? So there's all sorts of benefits. <coughs> it is one of the number one things that we can do here is fix our backlog. And to do that, it's a function of, of labor, uh, like having enough labor. It's a function of productivity, which is the number of sinks that we, units that we make per laborer, uh, per labor dollar. It's a function of maintenance, so the stuff isn't breaking down. It's a function of better management. It's a function of everything that we need to do. We don't have the answer yet, but we're getting closer. And that's on my list of my goals for September, October. Um, and that's, that's my main one for September, October. Uh, just so nobody's shocked, we also bought the property next door. I don't know where I'm facing, but I would say to the east. That's the road. Wherever, the, that's, that's the road? Yeah. So this piece of property up here, does that make sense? Anyways, that's gonna be uh, listed, I think this week. It's got nothing to do with Novani. Um, but I own that as well. Sinclair Range owns that. And uh, presumably, I, I, I think it's gonna take a year to sell that. So it's like not gonna do anything in the short term. But if it does, we're gonna take some of that cash and put it into capital expenditures and maintenance and clean up in here. So it's just a little bit of part of the deal. Um, but I just don't know anybody wanna come into work and see a for sale sign over there because there will be presumably a for sale sign over there. I wanna talk to you quickly about uh, branding. What is branding, right? When you talk about the Novani brand, the name of the company, uh, the West and some of the other brands here. Well, branding is what 
one way to think about it that's easy is branding is what people say about you when you're not listening, huh. right? What do you say about your Apple phone when uh, the Apple people, Tim Cook, isn't listening to you? That's kind of one way to think about branding. There's a million ways to think about branding. Um, and when we talk about Novani the company as opposed to our, our sync brands, when we talk about Novani the company, people ask me, why do we do these martinis with Scott shows on uh, YouTube? Has anybody not seen this or at least heard? I don't, I don't expect you to watch, but has anybody not heard that we do this? Yeah, so on YouTube, if you just look up Martinis with Scott, I do a weekly show, and nine of those shows in the last couple of months um, have been about Navani, and I'm sharing the turnaround journey. And sharing it pretty specifically, um, without trying to give hard numbers away, like so for example, we're recording right now, and this will go on the channel uh, for Thursday release. And so, and the idea behind the show is it's, um, it's, it's, it's trying to share information with entrepreneurs and business executives and people around the world who are learning about business and about changing momentum uh, in a company. And so we're using Devani as an example. So people say, well, why the hell do you do that? Why are you airing your laundry out in public? Well, that's about building brand. We're not trying to sell them anything. We're not trying to sell you a sink because you listen to the show, but people love the story and they learn and they get to buy into it. Why am I telling you this? I bet you I've had five calls, maybe more, in the last two weeks from old reps that used to work with Navani, from customers that used to buy from Navani, and they've been following along, and they love what we're doing, they think it's exciting, the change that's happening, and now we're starting to set up meetings to bring some of these reps back in in territories that we don't have right now. Okay, so it's been a it's been a cool experience, and if you want to look at it, it's uh, and sometimes I give you sometimes I give you a week's heads up on things that might happen, like a race before everybody else gets to know. <laughs> uh, so that's on YouTube and Apple Podcasts. That was my list for today. It was a pretty quick list, and uh, happy to take questions. Come on, guys, you always have questions. How long do you think the overtime will last? until I have an answer on what to do with this backlog, okay? Um, is it becoming an issue? No. I don't see it going away anytime soon. All right, we, we, we need to get through this and I don't know what the answer is, okay? But I want an answer this week. I keep asking, it's been, a, it's been an issue. Um, I don't have a firm answer for you. But I, I don't see any scenario where we wake up in the next month and say, okay, let's go back to 40 hours. I don't see that happening. Anybody else? Yeah, the uh, supply chain here, annoyed with it. And on the straightener end of it, we're really annoyed with it. We're not getting it. It takes four to five weeks I realize for a container to come from China. Container so it's coming. been all of July. Actually, it's been the last week of June. It's been all of July. It's been all of August, and we're three weeks into September. So yeah, I'm annoyed with it. And the container that is coming in doesn't have half the goods we need to finish this. Break. I think there's another one following it up. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's been a challenge. We now have weekly calls with our supplier. Um, they're actually not in China, they're in Taiwan, but we have weekly uh, Zoom calls with them uh, by video. Uh, Frank and I do that, and just where are we at? So they, in turn, it turns out that they don't directly manufacture. They go out, they broker. So they go out, and it turns out because Navani wasn't paying them that they also weren't paying their people. So there's been a lot of sort of rebuilding throughout. My patience is wearing thin. Is air freight cheaper or about the same? Oh, God, level? no. No. <laughs> no. No, it's not nearly as horrendous as it used to be. Right, but if, <laughs> if you want to try and eliminate your backlog, is there... Everything that... Well, but our, our backlog only partially relates to that issue. Right. Right, our backlog has a lot to do with labor and productivity and, you know, should we be running another shift? Well, we don't have the people... And then if we did, and then we plow through the backlog, then what do we do? Get rid of all those people? Like that's maybe not the right answer either. Um, 
so I don't know that the 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 Asians part of the supply chain is directly related to the backlog. It is a part for sure. Okay. Um, sorry, I forgot what your question was when I started talking about. Well, uh, oh, air freight. Yeah, well, you want to eliminate some of the backlog. Well, you got every you got way the loss of air freight. Totally. So every week, here. every week I've approved at least one. It feels like sometimes two air freight. Uh, packages on FedEx uh, from China or Taiwan they, every week. and I've never once said no that costs too much because frankly if it costs five or ten thousand dollars and it cures some of the backlog I'm not doing a well we, we're gonna we're gonna sell 20,000 of product and our margin on that is this I'm not doing that analysis because I don't care we need to invest in clearing this backlog and so every time there's an opportunity to air freight we've been doing that but if you can send a big container then that's what you that's what we can do. You said uh, supplies from it's coming by container. Uh, is that other supplies as well, or just trainers? I believe there's a whole mishmash of things in there, but I don't know that specifically. Where's Colleen? Does she know that? Yeah. So the answer to your question is no. Um, so we have a weekly call to discuss exactly that. Uh, we've hired a uh, super duper IT guy. I think I mentioned that before, I forget. Uh, super duper, he's so good he managed to shut down the whole company for uh, three days last week. So so thank you for that, Avi. But, <laughs> but um, you know, you need, to, you need to be able to dive into Sage, which is a, a database accounting uh, production system and actually understand it and what what happens at every company including Navani is you have this world-class system but nobody really knows how to use it and then your your bill of materials are all out of date and then at Navani is to make things more fun um, your, your bill of materials has six or eight levels of bombs he told me right because this this piece is actually now an input to that piece and so on and so forth and so uh, we went through a, we went through maybe three, four weeks ago, a uh, third party vendor presentation on both uh, an output management system, uh, so it's tied to orders and you should be producing this today, like it actually spits out, automates that for you, and then that generates what you should have ordered like a month ago, specifically by part. But to make that, and it's, it's gonna be like $20,000 for both ends of that to add on to, to Sage. But to actually accomplish that, we need to clean up our bombs, right? We need to know what we're buying and why, because what you guys are doing is you're, you've been around so long, you're doing it by the seat of your pants because you know what you need. And, and, and that's great, but I don't know what you need, right? And no one can communicate it to me because I'm too stupid, right? And there, you have so many part numbers. So what we need is we need an automation system around that, and until we have that, we're going to be we're going to be winging it to be blunt, which is kind of what we're doing. Um, but we're winging it better than we were, and we actually are starting down that process of automating that whole thing. Okay. One of the things I heard on listening to her so far is that at the front office we make a production schedule uh, uh, for the day. And then I want to measure attainment. In other words, you're supposed to produce this. Did you produce it? And then what I heard was when it gets out back, the, your team takes it and they say, okay, well, this is a wish list, but I actually, <laughs> I actually have the stuff to make that. And also I got HD coming in, so I want to make that, right? And so you just make whatever you think you're gonna make back here, right? To try and keep the, the, the process going. And so that's a problem. You have to do that, and thank you for doing that. But it's a problem for management, as you can imagine, and it flows into purchasing, right? And so, you know, at the end of the day, we need a system that where we have the stuff on hand. And I think the answer to that in the short term is to overbuy, just overbuy everything, right? And carry too much inventory and not be efficient that way, and then and then have these systems, and then ultimately, at the end of the day, which is going to be like a year from now, but at the end of the day have this automated so that when you get a schedule 
uh, it's going to have very few changeovers and you're going to be able to produce, right? And if you don't produce and if you don't attain that schedule, then we have to talk about that because now it's going to be on you, not on, not on front office and lack of supplies. I think that makes sense. Well, let me get some of the machines fixed that have been down for about two months. Well, the question was, how do we fix some of the machines that have been down two months? I now have a, uh, are those machines on my list that you gave me? Yeah. Okay, so next step for me, which we could do this week, is prioritize that and start and start authorizing. The, I, I assume it's a money issue, probably money and labor or? Money, problem. Right, well, it's not a money issue. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is prioritize it and we can do that. So let's work this week. Uh, I actually got the whole maintenance list put on a, on a program that I use for, for listing out things. So we're gonna start prioritizing them and, and uh, if that's critical, it sounds like it is, we'll get to the top. What else we got? All right, thank you everybody. Good to see you again. Back to work. Thank you.